Hi, welcome to Naptime Nutrition. I'm Yaffe Lavova, registered dietitian, nutritionist, and owner of Baby Blue Nutrition and Toddler Test Kitchen. And with me today is the fabulous Stephanie Van Zeldfen. <laughs> <laughs> we practiced that a little bit. <laughs> and she is Nutrition Hungry on Instagram, and we'll go over where you can find her at the end of the broadcast. But we are talking about snack time. Thanks so much for joining me, Stephanie. Thank you so much for having me. I'm so excited to be chatting with you. Yeah, well, this was actually spurred by one of your Instagram posts about snack and the components of snack. And I thought it was genius because I I usually create lists, but you created a, an effective infographic to help parents put together the components of a snack. And there are so many questions about snacks that come up with parents. So I thought it was good to have a conversation about it. Yeah, definitely. Snacks are like that quintessential kid, you know, everyone loves snacks and so it's it's great to talk about and and to give parents great tips on how to help with with snack time in their house yeah and so the first thing we want to get across really is that snacks are important and not only important they're actually essential snacks are essential mm -hmm. a lot of times we have parents who may be dealing with some picky eating issues and they want to withhold snacks in an effort to encourage mealtime eating mm -hmm. and that's not something that we encourage for a number of reasons. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Mean, kids, you know, they have such small bellies and they really can't go, you know, as long as we can as adults without eating. And so snacks really help, you know, give them that fuel to, to kind of power them through the rest of the day. And then like you were saying, um, you know, can actually give them more opportunities to try new foods during the day. It's one of the reasons that I really like snacks. Yeah, and that's so important. So let's define a snack versus a meal. We'll start there and we're going to get more and more interesting as we go. So, yeah. so what's the difference between a snack and a meal? So I was thinking about it and I think for toddlers, there's really no difference, you know, at least as far as like size goes. I mean, we often serve different foods for snacks than we do for meals. Um, but like for the little ones, you know, they're eating small meals or snacks or whatever you call them, you know, throughout the day. Um, and then I kind of see like as kids get older, a snack just becomes like a slightly smaller meal. Is that is that kind of how you see it too? Yeah, that's definitely how I see it. And what I loved about your post was that it recognized that you need different components for a snack. Mm -hmm. There are very rare instances where I will advise um, popcorn as a snack by itself because, and of course, popcorn is also a choking hazard for kids ages four and under. But but the reason why popcorn is not a great snack on its own is because it's not filling. And we'll get to that. I'm skipping ahead. So <laughs> so it's important to snack because like, like you mentioned, a toddler's stomach is small. And the truth is that even with adults, if you hold up the size of your fist, this is the size of your stomach. Mm -hmm. And so even adults sometimes need to snack. Mm -hmm. And the fist the fist um, tool is great to use because it's great for kids because as they grow, their fist grows just as mm -hmm. their stomach is growing. Mm -hmm. So it remains an adequate tool to understand that how much food is really going to be satisfying. Sometimes it's a little, sometimes it's a lot. Also depends on the amount of air in the food back to the whole popcorn idea yeah. but but it's important to snack because the feeling of hunger can actually work against a child when they come to the table for a meal mm -hmm. if they're feeling too hungry that can be overstimulating for them yeah. and it depresses their appetite rather than encouraging them to eat yeah we want them to be you know hungry you know we want them to have you know like hey time to eat like i'm excited uh but you know we don't want them to be hangry, cranky, you know, too hungry. I mean, same with adults too. I, I think sometimes, you know, some people I talk to, um, we get so busy with our day or, or we get so hungry, you know, just because we haven't eaten or whatever it is that you get to that point where your hunger kind of goes away, or at least in, in your mind, it kind of goes away, but it's still there um, right. that you're not really able to, to cope with it in the same way. Right. Yeah. And that's a great point because a lot of times people ask about sugar cravings and a lot of times sugar cravings will come about because you passed that hunger point. Mm -hmm. And so your body starts out saying, I want a sandwich. And then it moves into something sweeter and sweeter and sweeter until you need that Snickers bar or ice cream or whatever, just because it's not 
it's not a behavioral thing. It's not the child rebelling or the adult for that matter, not following their eating plan. It's, it's that the body is just craving nutrition yeah. And simple sugars are absorbed very quickly. And so the body starts craving easier and easier foods to turn into, into energy faster. And that's where we get that. Yeah, it's helpful to keep in mind that a lot of times those cravings are really just our biology. You know, it's not yeah. like you have a weakness for sweets or anything like that. It's like your body is just like, please, I need something, you know, help me out. Give me some quick energy. Um, and that's And that's sugary foods, you know. Right. And I think that that keeping in mind that biology really helps parents to understand that this is not a behavioral issue for either the child or the adult. Yeah. <laughs> I think that's a really great point. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So let's talk about the, the infographic. And I would do a screen share, but we're going podcast with this. So that would be a little pointless. But if, if you're listening in podcast world, please go over to Nutrition Hungry on Instagram and check that out. But so why don't you talk about that? And how you put it together. Sure. So one of the things that is so helpful to think about when it comes to snacks is creating snacks that are going to be satisfying, nourishing, and filling. And so sometimes when we think of snack, I brought I brought an aid, and I think this will work really well for your podcast. But this is this is what when I hear the sound, this is like snack in my mind. <laughs> These like, you know package things like this, right? Um, we, we maybe think about snacks in that way, but sometimes we don't think about building a snack or creating a snack with multiple components. And these things are totally great to have, but on its own, it's not going to be super satisfying. It's not going to be super nourishing and filling. So what I did is I kind of broke it out into the three different food group categories. The first one being fruits and vegetables. The second one, uh, different grains like bread, crackers, tortillas, popcorn. And the third food group being different proteins or fats. So like yogurt, nuts, peanut butter, cheese, sunflower seeds, meat, things like that. And so uh, for the most part, when I'm thinking about snacks and thinking about building snacks for, for my daughter or for, or for her clients, I want to include at least two different food groups. So that might be combining a fruit with a grain or a vegetable with a protein source. Uh, combining two food groups together will make a more filling and satisfying snack. And you also have a little bit of flexibility to kind of see you know, because you know your child best, you know how hungry they get, you know their schedule. There are some days that you know your child is like extra hungry, or maybe like they really didn't like their lunch, they didn't eat that much. You know that they need something really filling and satisfying for that day. And so what I would do is actually include all three food groups. You include uh, not just an apple, not just an apple with peanut butter, but an apple with peanut butter and some crackers. It makes it even more satisfying and even more nourishing for them. And on the flip side, if you, you know, everyone's schedule has been a little topsy-turvy, you know, maybe you, you just need a snack today that's going to hold you over like the hour, hour and a half until dinner. Um, or maybe, you know, your kid hasn't been super hungry because they ate like a gigantic lunch. You might just want to do like a little bit of a smaller snack and maybe just with one food group, maybe just with the apples or just with some popcorn. Uh, if you if you know that something lighter is going to be more appropriate for that day. Mm -hmm. Right. And that's exactly where I was coming from when I said that I rarely say popcorn because that's exactly it. If you if if dinner isn't ready when you wanted it to be or if you had traffic or something, yeah. sometimes it's better to have a simple snack because that will satisfy, that will take the edge off of the hunger mm -hmm. without being satisfying in a way that will prevent an appetite at the meal that's coming up. Mm -hmm. So sometimes you can use that as a tool and that's a really valid thing to do. It helps them. Um, sometimes what I do is, you know, it's like inevitable. It's like 20 minutes before dinner's done or like, you know, dinner's starting to cook and you're like, I'm hungry. I need 
a snack. And, you know, a lot of times I'm like, dinner's almost ready. Let's do something else. Let's wait. But sometimes if you can just kind of tell, like, you know what, she needs something in her belly. I'll say, hey, come help me. Look, I'm cutting up tomatoes. Do you want a piece of tomato? You can have a tomato. You can have, um, we're having grapes with dinner. You want to try some of these? And so you kind of use like your dinner as a little snack snack appetizer snack appetizer if you will did you just make that up that's awesome i'm 90 percent sure i plagiarized that from somewhere but check because i might be using that if if no one else has coined it we sh yeah we should look that up that's a really great one yeah, but there's a place for that. And so mm -hmm. we, we definitely want to feed smaller kids every two to three hours. Mm -hmm. And as they get bigger, some people say three to four hours. I still like to stay with the two to three hour range for my kids mm -hmm. and for myself. So that's where you use your gut instinct. And, and like you mentioned, when the child is saying, I'm hungry, and you know dinner is going to happen in 20 or 30 minutes, mm -hmm. sometimes you can tell, you can say, oh, dinner's almost ready. And sometimes you're gonna need to take action and it's important to use your gut instinct. Yeah, exactly. Like um, yesterday, my three-year-old had a later snack in the afternoon and she it was like a really filling snack. You know, it was a very satisfying snack. So I didn't have any of that before dinner you know, whining, asking for food. Um, so that was nice. You know, I, I enjoyed that. And and actually, even at dinner, she didn't even eat that much, probably because she was still a little bit full from the mm -hmm. had before. So you kind of get a sense, you kind of learn your kids' appetite, you know, you learn what foods fill them more or, or don't fill them. And you can, you can almost predict their appetite in a way. Right. Yeah, and I think it's important. I'll just take a moment here to get to go off script and talk about how the, a parent's gut instinct is important. Mm -hmm. It really is. And it's not a determining factor on its own, but we as clinicians have certain educational background and experience, but we use that in conjunction with the parent's gut instinct and their knowledge of their child mm -hmm. because the textbooks are like musical notes. And working with someone one-on-one -on -one, or even speaking in front of the group, our job is to help you make music out of those notes and to make it fit your family and your situation. We can't just open a textbook and know who you are and what your priorities are and your cooking skills and your abilities and your desires and flavor profiles. So that's why it's really important to, to include the gut instinct when we're talking about these things. Oh, definitely. You know, especially if there's any, any concerns, you know, with your kid's health or your kid's eating, you know, we always need to, to listen to what mom and dad and any other caregivers are saying, because you're with your kid. Well, nowadays we're with our kid <laughs> 24 hours. It's a lot of family time. Um, it is. <laughs> Sometimes, you know, I'm happy to close the door and lock it, you know, for a little bit. Yeah, you can see the, the Hot Wheels behind my head. This, I'm definitely in my kid's room right now. Um, <laughs> and I think I forgot to lock the door, but hopefully there won't be a problem. Okay, we'll get some interruptions. Oh, I have, I find toys in my bed. I, I wake up and <laughs> Amazing. Okay, so let's talk about, this is especially relevant right now, but it always plays a role, the pros and cons of prepackaged snacks. Mm -hmm. What are your feelings on packaged snacks? Well, my guess is that we have the same feelings. Um, <laughs> honestly, when I first started out as the type A mom, I thought I was going to make everything. And the thing is that, that it brings so much stress when you... Mm -hmm. When you decide that everything has to be homemade from scratch, it, it really brings a lot of stress into the equation. And when you have stress preparing food, then that's going to feed into, ha, pun intended, it's going to feed into the mealtime stress because you made it and you spent that much energy on it. And if the child isn't feeling it that day or isn't feeling it at all, ever, then there's an added degree of stress because of the amount of time that you put into that while stressed out from other things, just parenthood in general, and possibly lockdown, and possibly 
it, there's an ingredient that is difficult to find and you finally tracked it down and now the child is refusing it. Mm -hmm. So it's not to say that everything should be prepackaged, but we really need to kind of relax our view mm -hmm. on prepackaged equals evil. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm right there with you when I, uh, when my daughter was first born, like I was, you know, oh, I'm going to make everything. I'm going to do all of this, you know, and then you realize that that's not necessary to be healthy or to be a good role model for your kid. There's absolutely a place for packaged snacks. Like even these guys. <laughs> the fruit gummies. Oh my gosh. When she first discovered those at daycare, she was very happy. Um, you know, I, I think that um, there is a lot of a, a lot of like negative connotations associated with packaged food. And, and I think a lot of it is, is really unwarranted because, you know, a lot of these things are things that you could possibly make at home, like the granola bars. It's like, they're not so different than how you would make them at home, but they're super convenient. Kids love them. A lot of them have their favorite characters on the front. So that's like very exciting for them. It's really fun. So it's like, why not do a balance and, and, and feel free to, you know, to enjoy it and don't feel guilty about it. Right. Mm -hmm. So I'm going to piggyback on the whole character on the package idea. And so for some kids, it's going to be really exciting. And for other kids, they're going to get really, really hooked on particular packaging. And so this is where the gut instinct comes in. If you have a child who gets really, really hooked on a particular look of packaging or you think that your child will, it's best to remove the product from the packaging before giving it to your child mm -hmm. for a couple of reasons. One is that sometimes, especially right now, specific products are not always available. And if your child is used to seeing particular characters on a package, they might really feel it when that exact packaging is not available. Yeah. And sometimes companies change their packaging and that causes all kinds of waves in toddler land when a company changes their packaging and and you wanted a particular Paw Patrol character on your granola bar and now it's a different Paw Patrol character and the world is ending. Yeah. So to avoid that, if that's a problem in your family, it's best to remove it from the packaging before giving it to your child. But for a lot of kids, it's perfectly fine and it's a fun thing. Yeah, and that's a really good point. You know, it's also nice, I think, to choose packaged snacks that you like too. You know, we're allowed to eat those things also. So if you like the grown up granola bars, you know, that don't have Paw Patrol on them or, or whatever kind of yogurt that doesn't have trolls on them, then, you know, that's totally fine. You know, you can, you can absolutely decide, you know, which package snacks you want to purchase, which brands you want to purchase. Um, absolutely. Right. And the benefit of that is that if you give it to the child and they're not into it that day, it's something that you enjoy. So which all is not lost. All the time. <laughs> well, we as adults are in the mood for things sometimes and not other times. And it's the mm -hmm. same with our kids. A lot of times we really need to think about how we as adults respond to a certain situation and then be that open and that gentle with our kids because they have different appetites from day to day. They have different cravings from day to day. And of course we advocate division of responsibility and responsive feeding so that there are boundaries around that and you're not becoming a short order cook. Mm -hmm. But at the same time, it's good to have that perspective that allows everyone the freedom to have different cravings on different days and to eat different amounts. Yeah, and I think having that understanding also takes some of your stress down as a parent because you help to understand and you can see it a little bit from your kid's perspective. Um, so it's not so stressful if, well, you liked this yesterday. Why don't you want to eat this today? Um, so it takes some of that stress down. You recognize that this is something that even happens to you as a as a grown up, so it's okay. It's it's totally normal. You know, it's not something to to necessarily worry about. Yeah, I think that's really important. So we talked about timing a little bit. Um, sometimes it gets really difficult when kids are in school and they have lunch and then they have nothing after lunch. I know last year when my kids were in, when my twins were in first grade, they had lunch at ten thirty in the morning. There was no afternoon snack, and they came home famished starving so 
Yeah, and so sometimes you can you can mess with the, the PTA and you can try to encourage the school to do an afternoon snack, but sometimes that's not within your power. Sometimes it's not something that can be changed. So the best idea is to just be really ready when the kids get off the bus or with a snack in the car, be ready for that because they're going to be hangry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's tough for them, I'm sure. Yeah. And so this is where I did advise popcorn was, was a situation like that where the kids just come home completely hungry. And the mother I was I was counseling moved up dinner from what we would consider a normal dinner time back to four o'clock and then would offer a snack where you would normally have dinner. And that's a reasonable solution for situations like that. Yeah, absolutely. I've heard a lot of families do that. They'll move up dinner till it's so it's more like a what we would think of as like a supper almost, you know, it's, it's earlier than, you know, sometimes you would eat, but it's still like giving them a nice big meal at the end of their school day. And then it makes perfect sense then to have a snack a little bit later before bed, because then there would be a long gap between their supper, their early dinner and bedtime. So it is appropriate to give them, you know, to offer a snack at that time. Right. And bedtime snack is a question that comes up a lot. And really, if you've got about two hours after the previous meal, mm -hmm. give a bedtime snack and be consistent about that. And also know your kids. If your child is using it to delay bedtime, you probably have a gut instinct about that. Mm -hmm. And if your child is actually hungry, then that's something to consider. And you can either shift dinner around or introduce a bedtime snack. And with bedtime snacks, we want to keep it fairly boring. We don't want it to be something that's so exciting that they rush through dinner to get to the bedtime snack, <laughs> right? Like the fruit snacks. <laughs> and so that's where I would advise something like um, an apple with peanut butter, yeah. maybe the crackers, depending on the timing of dinner. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think I think that makes a lot of sense. Consistency, um, where you're either offering bedtime snack every day or you don't offer bedtime snack every day. There's always room, I think, for a little, you know, life happens, you know, things happen, you know, that's fine. But it's it's what are you doing the majority of the time? You're either offering it the majority of the time or you're not offering it the majority of the time. And then yeah, a boring snack because my daughter, she'll ask for all sorts of things at bedtime. And we don't do a bedtime snack here. We used to when she was younger because she used to eat dinner earlier. But now we eat dinner a little bit later, so there's no there's no bedtime snack. But once in a while, I'll get a very silly request for bedtime snack. It's like, no, we're not having snack right now. We can have that for breakfast, but you know, not right now. So yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And you shouldn't use dinner as a bedtime snack. We shouldn't just save what's on the plate and reintroduce it because what was on their plate, they're done with. Yeah. So you can either repurpose it or save it for another time or toss it, whatever whatever it is at that meal, but you don't wanna reintroduce exactly what you had for dinner at bedtime snack. It's not it's not appealing. If you think about it as an adult, we don't wanna have the same food two snacks in a row yeah. or two meals in a row, unless it's pizza, because obviously, I mean, you know, pizza. Of course. <laughs> pizza. <laughs> I am um, just talking about pizza. We, um, I gave my daughter cold pizza for the first time a few weeks ago. It's like one of my, favorites and she was like I was like do you want it warm or do you want it cold she's like cold hmm she like she went gaga she loved it <laughs> so I'm so proud <laughs> that's so funny someone else to have yeah. pizza with me my my little man who's three prefers his pizza and his waffles straight out of the fridge or the freezer and the rest of us will have it. Yeah. No. Yeah. The waffle straight out of the freezer, but the rest of us will have it warmed up mm -hmm. and he is very insistent. He wants it cold and I'm okay with that. I think that's a fair request. Wow. Yeah. So you mentioned getting kids involved when, when they're asking for a snack right before dinner and you can bring them into meal prep, which is something that I'm always on top of. That's, I mean, on Instagram, I'm toddler test kitchen. So that's what I'm doing, cooking with kids. Yeah. But that's a great tool. So how else can we get them involved mm -hmm. in like in planning and prepping? Yeah, I mean, I think as much as possible, like nowadays, it's a little bit tricky, but as much as possible to involve your kids with grocery shopping. 
Um, I know not a lot of us are really bringing our kids to the grocery store right now, or like we're trying not to, but even if you're picking out groceries to order online, or even before you go to the store, you can, you can talk about it or look at pictures of different fruits and vegetables, different foods and say, Hey, what do you think we should get at the grocery store? What, what's something that you think you want to try this week? You know, get a little bit of their input. They can get excited about that. Um, and then also with the little ones, what I like to do is give them a reasonable choice, you know, between two, maybe three different options for snack. Say like, hey, for snack today, we can either have apples or bananas. What do you think? Or, you know, we can have yogurt or um, cheese. Which one are you, are you feeling like you want more? Um, that's a great way to give them a little bit of independence and, and let them, you know, kind of have a say in things and get them involved, makes them more likely to, to want to eat their snack and to really enjoy it, especially if it's something new or something that they're not, you know, they haven't eaten so much in the past. Um, another thing with kids is having them help with, with washing their fruits and vegetables, pulling stuff out of the packages and kind of counting it out. You know, hey, can you put three crackers on everyone's plate? Let them practice their counting skills. Um, that's always a fun thing to do, make it educational at, at the same time and involve that, that learning process. And then I think as kids get older, they can certainly help with developing a meal plan or a menu for the week. Um, I know um, a lot of parents will do like a snack drawer. Um, so I think we'll kind of talk about that, which, which is a way to give kids a lot more autonomy as to what their snacks are. Um, because it's, it's really, you know, you just have like a whole drawer in your fridge or like a little Tupperware and you kind of put all the different snack options in there. Um, so that can be helpful for planning what your snacks are going to be. You can say, Hey, look in the snack drawer. You see all of our options. What do you think we should have for snack, you know, today, tomorrow, the next day, let them kind of, you know, think about it and write down, you know, think about what they want to have. Um, or some, or some families like to, you know, anything in the snack drawer is fair game. You can kind of pick and choose what you want. Um, so that's something that's not always going to work for all families. And I think it is better for older kids. And it's always nice when it's an activity that you guys do together because you can help guide your kids to choose different foods um, and, and a combination of foods that are going to be nourishing and filling and satisfying for them. Right. And I think it's great that you mentioned the ages because when kids are younger, they really need that instant gratification. Mm -hmm. So asking a two-year-old what they want for dinner when it's noon is not going to go over well because whatever they say, they're not going to remember they said it and they're not going to be in the mood for it by the time dinner comes around. So planning a couple days in advance is even more inappropriate. Mm -hmm. But as they get older, they do develop that ability to wait. So when they're six, seven, eight years old, they can certainly be talking about what's going to be for dinner or snacks in the next few days. Mm -hmm. So it becomes appropriate at that point. Yeah, definitely. It's a, it's a nice, um, it's a nice thing for them to do. It's a nice skill to develop. And then it's also something to look forward to, especially when they've chosen something that they're very excited about. Um, you know, it, it just makes it like a fun, you know, little thing to look forward to. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. So let's talk about, we, we like division of responsibility where the parents are in charge of what you're eating, when you're eating, and where you're eating. And the child is in charge of whether they're eating or not and how much they're eating. And then there's the idea of the snack drawer. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> they don't seem to go together, mm -hmm. uh, but different families benefit from different approaches sometimes. And we can make the snack drawer fit within division of responsibility. And sometimes it's just going to be something that works for your family. So let's, let's talk about that. Mm hmm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think there's there's different ways to even customize this idea of a snack drawer, like for your family. Um, the way that I first learned about it, it's a drawer in your fridge or like a Tupperware snacks go in there. And if your kid wants a snack, even if it's not snack time or not meal time, they can kind of pick and choose something from the snack drawer. Uh, that's not always how you have to do it. 
um, the way that I kind of see it working for a lot of families is when it's snack time, you can choose a snack from the snack drawer. But when it's not snack time, we generally wait until it is snack time. We find something else to do. Um, it's not necessarily, you know, whenever you're, whenever you're feeling for something, you kind of go to the snack drawer because we don't necessarily want to be snacking all day. You know, we don't want to fill ourselves up too much before dinner. We want to have some kind of structure. Um, but again, like you said, for some families, you know, um, and I, I really like that Instagram post that you shared, um, kind of talking about, you know, the, the idea of like the closed kitchen, um, you know, this idea in, which is in division of responsibilities that, you know, when it's not mealtime, it's not snack time. You say the kitchen is closed. We're not, we're not having anything to eat right now, but I think that Instagram post was so helpful. And, and I hadn't even really thought about that for a lot of kids that it, it puts a lot of pressure on them, you know, knowing that the kitchen is closed. Um, and it can, it can become a little bit stressful when you're having a meal or having a snack. You, you know, if the parent says, remember after snack, the kitchen is closed until dinner time. It puts a little bit of more pressure on your kid to eat a little bit extra you know, oh, I have to fill myself up because dinner is going to be a while away. Um, so we want to be careful with the language that we're using and, and make sure that we are not putting too much pressure on kids, um, even in those subtle ways, like saying like the kitchen, the kitchen is closed. Mm -hmm. Right. Yeah. yeah. And that, that post was originally from Noreen Hunani, who who focuses specifically on autistic population. And so for autistic kids, food can be very difficult because it hits every sense. Yeah. And even the, the body processes that bring together the senses, it can be overwhelming. And so that idea that the kitchen is closed can be added pressure for kids who already have issues with their relationship with food due to that sensory input. So it's very important to know your child. With my kids, I say the kitchen is closed, but I know them and I know that that's going to be okay. And for someone else, that might not be an okay thing to do. And they might they might have a closed kitchen, but get that across in a different way, or they might have a different approach altogether. So it's important that we recognize what works for our family. We do want to avoid constant grazing because Grazing doesn't allow us to form an appetite for the next meal or snack. And that appetite is really how our body connects with our, our brain, our, our gut and our brain to tell us what we need and how much we need. So when you have constant grazing, even though it seems like you're eating all day, you're not really getting the nutrition that you need. Mm -hmm. And so that was the idea behind the closed kitchen. So if if you have a child who doesn't deal well with the idea of a closed kitchen between meals and snacks, that might be a reason to reach out to someone like Noreen who can help identify which path is appropriate for your family to maximize happiness and nutrition at the same time. Yeah, I think that's a great point. Reaching out to the right specialist that can really help develop a plan that works for, for your family, because what works for one family does not work for every family. And so, you know, best to find something that works best for you and, and really helps your kids thrive and helps your family just feel connected, feel less stress around meals. It's so important. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, okay, so what else did we do? Oh, plan and prep with kids we talked about. Okay, where does dessert fit in? This is a really common question. Whenever I talk to parents about division of responsibility and you have your snacks, which are mini meals, and you have your meals, and they're spaced two to three hours apart, and I tell them to be proactive with sweets so that the whole family is enjoying it. It models food enjoyment. It's a fun activity for everyone. And the inevitable next question is, but when does that happen? Yeah. I mean, whenever, why not? You know, I, I don't do this all the time, but there have definitely been times where I've let my daughter have something sweet with breakfast. You know, why not? Who says sweets need to be confined to dinner time or, you know, uh, in the evening time? Um, you know, I, I actually like serving sweets with afternoon snack. Um, it, it really helps break up the afternoon. You know, it, it just makes it a little bit 
especially with COVID and everyone being stuck inside, you know, um, it just, you know, she's always happy to, you know, get a lollipop or, or whatever it is. Um, so a lot of times for afternoon snack, I'll do whatever the regular snack was, you know, yogurt, some fruit, let's say, and Hey, would you like to have a lollipop too? Yes, of course. <laughs> so I'll just kind of throw that in there. Um, you, I mean, you can do sweets with lunch. You can do sweets with dinner, breakfast sometime, you know, I, I don't yeah. do with including it at any time of, of day. Um, and I think like you said, being proactive about it and including sweets, um, at those different times a day just reinforces the idea that they're a regular food, just like all the other foods that we eat. And, and there's, I mean, of course they taste delicious, um, but that doesn't mean that they're that they're better than any other food that's also delicious. Right. I think that's a great point that people don't understand a lot. We have a whole lot of um, a whole lot of back and forth in the community about in the, in the nutrition community about foods being morally superior versus nutritionally superior. Okay. Yes, an apple has more nutrition and more nutrition value than I'll fill in the blank like lollipop, let's say mm -hmm. lollipop. Okay, but they're not morally different. Mm -hmm. So there is no good food or bad food mm -hmm. and it's good to have a balance, but when we restrict it, when we give those sweet foods negative labels, it makes them more attractive. It actually makes them taste better mm -hmm. when they have a forbidden fruit label on them. So the best idea is to just be neutral about it and be proactive. Mm -hmm. And as you're saying, serve it with a meal, if, particularly if you've got a selective eating issue, which is my fancy way of saying picky, because I don't like to say picky. If you've got that kind of issue going on, a lot of a lot of dietitians will advise serving dessert with the meal, serving the chocolate cake with dinner alongside your chicken and broccoli and whatever. And it's just to reinforce that same concept that food is food. It's all neutral, and it sounds nuts. But if you do it, you see your child take a bite of chicken, take a bite of chocolate cake, take a bite of broccoli. It's the weirdest thing when it works, but it does. It's so crazy. And sometimes they don't even finish the sweet. They'll leave half the cookie on their plate or they, you know, they, they'll leave a little bit of, of whatever it is. And the first time you're like, whoa, like what's going on here? Um, but that's that's great. I mean, that just shows that they enjoy all different kinds of foods. They're listening to their stomachs. They're not forcing themselves to finish the cookie or finish the cake because it's a cookie and cake and we have to eat it all. You know, when, they're, when their bellies are full, like, okay, I'm done. I don't need the rest of this cookie. We're going to have cookies again sometime soon. I know we are. Mom, I know where mom keeps her cookies and I know that she brings out the cookies, you know, every, every so often. So I'm feeling okay about this. Um, yeah. yeah, it's a great feeling when you look at their plate and, and they actually haven't finished their sweet because it, it shows you, you know, that that's working. Right. And sometimes they will finish it and ask for a second serving. And that's also okay. It just doesn't impact you as much as seeing when they don't finish it. My kids will go to a birthday party and they don't finish their cake. And I'm thinking, why don't you finish it? It's cake. But that's because I have this years of psychological buildup and labels and all that. And kids are not born with that. They don't have it. So if you make food neutral, they're more likely to eat the exact amount that satisfies them and then stop. And we as adults have to keep working on that. It's something that we do. I mean, I was, you know, you raised the same way. It's like, it's cake, you know, come on, eat the, you know, you have to finish it. Um, but then, you know, it is something for us to practice because we want our kids to have a better relationship with food than maybe we had. And so it's something for us to kind of always think about and, and challenge maybe like our, our instincts a little bit, you know, which are based on, like you said, the psychological buildup of, of how we were raised around food. Um, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so a healthy relationship with food is one where you just don't think about food that much. You can think about what are we having for lunch? What are we making for dinner? But beyond that, you're not feeling guilt or shame between meals and snacks. You're not earning your food or using it as a reward. You're not thinking about your next diet and I better eat all this ice cream so it's no longer in the house because I'm starting a diet tomorrow. Mm -hmm. 
this is what we want for our kids. Yeah. We want them to be able to enjoy a variety of food and not spend so much mental real estate thinking about food and about their body between. And that's that's the goal with this. That's a healthy relationship mm -hmm. with food. Beautifully said. I mean, that's why I love working in, in pediatrics and working with families so much because there's so, you know, you're getting them from such a young age and you and you can set them on this path where their future is just, I mean, think of all the time that, that we would save if, if, you know, as adults, if we didn't think about food so much and didn't have all those, those feelings of, you know, kind of a tumultuous relationship with food. Um, and so being able to give that to like a younger generation is, is awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's our whole goal as pediatric and family focused dietitians. That's what we're going for. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. I think we hit all of our points. Do you think there's anything else we should chat about? I think we got everything. I got a smiley face from my uncle as a live comment. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I, it's a time for I appreciate it, but um, was <laughs> we can't use that for anything. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I would say that I think is something really funny that's been happening in my house is my three-year-old has decided that all meals are called snacks. She she doesn't want dinner; she wants snack. <laughs> I was like, okay, we're having snack dinner. I mean, it's regular dinner, you know, but she, she just yeah. likes the label of a snack. So I, yeah. I think it's so funny. <laughs> She's three, you know? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh-oh. <laughs> I'm being interrupted. <laughs> okay, hang on. Yeah. Hi. Hi. <laughs> <Bye. laughs> no right. Well, I think we got all of our points. So, so tell... I got a Lego plane flying through my segment here. Um, so tell our viewers and listeners where they can find you. Yes. So I am on Instagram at Nutrition Hungry. I'm also on Facebook, also at Nutrition Hungry. And then if you check out my website, nutritionhungry.com, I have lots of different blog articles, different recipes. And I recently launched a, a goodies page with all these different freebies, downloads that you can go take a look at. So I actually have a meal planning template that I just put up there a couple weeks ago. So that might be helpful for folks looking to start planning a little bit of their meals and snacks ahead of time. That's really helpful. And I know a lot of people are really getting back into that with school starting, whether you're starting homeschooling or virtual or in person, whatever's appropriate at the time, meal planning really takes the stress off. That's uh, less you have to think about, less information to keep in your head. Definitely. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Stephanie, for joining me. This was really great. Thank you for having me, Yafi. It was so nice being on your show. I, I look forward to continuing with our, our relationship and keep talking about all these important topics. It's it's so great. Yeah, I appreciate it too. Well, thanks so much everyone for watching or listening, and I will see you next time at the next Naptime Nutrition.